thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I, uh, until I got this invitation, I had never really spent a lot of time thinking about what's normal in our data sets. Um, I, uh, the sort of standard talk format, but I'm combining several different studies that we've done to see what, what, we, what we know about normal airflow. But um, our motivation for these studies is pediatric obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, and we're particularly interested in the pharynx and what happens in the pharynx. So um, this affects 2 to 4 percent of normal children, and when we say normal, we mean not um, clinically obese and not with um, endocrine disorders or a number of other syndromes. Um, but even in this group, and uh, especially kids who are um, obese, the surgical treatments are not always effective. So <clears throat> our goal has been to try to think about different individualized airway models that we could build that help to integrate some things about anatomy and functional factors as a way of sorting out these patients and thinking about what's appropriate treatment. Um, but it's pretty much basic science. We're trying to describe what's different about patients with obstructive sleep apnea versus normals. Um, and uh, a lot of people in the literature say that um, uh, obstructive sleep apnea has both anatomical and functional factors. By anatomical, we mean things like larger tonsils and adenoids in these children. Um, and smaller airway volumes, and that's particularly true in the region where the adenoids, the tonsils, and the soft palate overlap, creating the, the, the area we think of as the velopharynx. Um, but also that we can have functional factors such as if we have a high or a positive critical closing pressure or um, sedated uh, patient closing pressure, um, that that's correlated with a, a loss of, of airway function, especially during sleep. Um, and maybe I should skip this slide, but it, I think it's worthwhile. This is our, our perspective when we think about the pharynx and about sleep apnea. We pretty much think of the nasal resistance as fixed, although it's not, it's not particularly fixed, but, but there's a lot more um, focus on what happens in the pharynx. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of things that we're not considering yet, but we're looking for useful models of the mechanics of the pharynx that could be included in some kind of a nonlinear systems model. Um, but we're not there yet. Uh, the aims of this talk, though, are to describe what we think of as normal airway characteristics in the pharyngeal area, uh, airway of normal subjects, and with one exception, these will be children. So the first one is just a verification model, which is my airway. Um, but we looked at children uh, ages three to seven um, initially um, without considering uh, weight directly. Um, and then our recent studies have been obese children. One group is both boys and girls ages 8 to 17, and the last one is adolescent girls who either did or didn't have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Most of these uh, subjects are obese, and the age, age range is, is later than the first group. Um, and the other thing is then to introduce uh, CFD airway uh, model endpoints, is what I used to call them because of my advisor, um, but my colleagues like to call them biomarkers now. Um, Okay, um, so how are we usually looking at these patients? Um, we, in, in a lot of cases, we have rhinomanometry measurements, and that's the way that we characterize what happens in the nasal passages. Um, and then we take uh, resting flow uh, waveforms right before the imaging study. So the, um, for rhinomanometry and the, the uh, pneumotechometer, the, the children are supine, they're relaxed, they're taking normal tidal breaths. Um, but that allows us to reconstruct average flow waveforms and to identify uh, a mean, mean peak expiratory and inspiratory flow rates um, in our subjects and to use those in our modeling. Um, we uh, started out doing what we would call static magnetic resonance imaging. All of our studies are based on MR images because of the risk involved with using CT scanning and especially when we want to do dynamic studies and we need to take repeated scans. Um, we have tended to do uh, manual segmentation based on grayscales and a lot of editing. Um, these are some sample uh, images when we do dynamic, um, it's retrospectively gated um, images. They're pretty noisy. Um, so we have to do a lot of manualing there. Um, so we do manually editing, we're reducing, uh, re reducing noise. If we're doing some kind of a um, uh, a nasal pa passage model, we take the um, nasal sinuses out and we have to differentiate carefully between bones, say, in the, the hard palate and airway, because they look similar. Um, and then we usually have to work hard around the epiglottis. It's, it's sometimes kind of mucousy there. It's noisy. Um, 
but we create a 3D object, we shrink wrap it, we spend a lot of time repairing mesh errors, and then we s typically set the flow inlets at the Kiwani so that we're modeling what's in the pharynx. Um, but I'll show you some things where we also have nasal passages. But you'll see that, that because we're doing um, MR-based imaging, we usually have pretty bad images of the uh, nasal passages. Um, we've done a variety of studies to try to verify um, uh, our CFD calculations. The first one is based on um, experiments done by Young and Sai, just to convince ourselves that turbulence modeling could work well, and it turned out to give us insight about the mesh. So um, maybe I'll take a, just a little extra time because this has come up. Um, I cam came from cardiovascular modeling background. We typically used um, hexahedrons and stretched them in the direction of flow and had a nice boundary layer in there. Um, so I created a, a nice mapped, fully structured mesh, mesh of this geometry. It's two intersecting circles. It's asymmetric. The Reynolds number is 900 based on upstream. Area reduction and, and expansion is just under 90 percent. So it's not too bad as a model uh, of, of the airway. There's just no curvature in it. So I made this nice um, map, and I, I don't have the data here because I didn't think it was going to be an issue. Um, if I use a skewed grid, I get the right pressure drop, the right pressure recovery, but the recovery length is about three times too long. So I'm not showing that here. So we're very comfortable with using an unstructured mesh because once we went to the unstructured mesh, we get the right, the right recovery length over here. So uh, raw data is here. We've used this to compare uh, large eddy simulations and the traditional K omega. Um, and we find the traditional K or a standard K omega with low Reynolds number correction factor, the one that you find in Fluent, actually works a little better in our hands than, um, than the, the uh, large eddy simulation. Um, we've done uh, uh, um, stereolithography-based models. And we, we looked at several issues related to CFD. Um, one of them was how to deal with steady versus unsteady or, or quasi-steady. In this model, uh, this is a, a three-year-old child. We have uh, a series of pressure ca caps taken along here. And um, uh, we, we compared running this with, with the pump getting as close as we could to a sinusoidal flow waveform. Um, we've also done things where we have a trapezoidal waveform with a much longer duration. So we're essentially running the experiment quasi-steady. And those experimental results are blue and red here. So in our hands, at the right Wamersley number, and um, the, this, is, this is matched to the flow rate for, the, uh, for, for a normal child this age, um, we s barely see any difference between running quasi-steady experiment and running unsteady experiment. So we, we think quasi-steady is OK. On the other hand, when we look at some of the pressure taps, there's actually some significant relatively low frequency um, stuff that's happening because the, the jet that forms here is unsteady. So we, we integrate the, the equations and solve the equations unsteady using a steady boundary condition. And that seems representative to us and, and, uh, and justified by our experiments. Um, okay, this is the third one. So this is uh, in vivo. This is my airway. Um, and if you take axial slices, MR, um, with the protocol that we were using, we, we miss all of the turbinate structure, but we have a reasonable idea of what the width of the turbul tur uh, turbinate structure is. Um, and then we validated this with posterior rhino rhinomanometry. And we were surprisingly happy. So we're comparing here. Um, all the gray stuff is, is the posterior rhinomanometry, the dots and the bars are from CFD from the region that communicates with, with the mouth, which is located right here. OK. Um, so what, what are the main features of the, the, uh, the pharynx in a normal subject? They're similar to a pharynx of, of a subject with obstructive sleep apnea. Typically, we see, um, we see narrowing of the airway in the, the velopharynx region followed by the formation of a turbulent jet that enters the retrolingual oropharynx or, uh, back here, um, a lot of complex recirculation. Um, this is a region, it, it, this is now looking at, at one slice near the midline. We see that we have high turbulence intensity of this jet, resulting in dissipation of pressure. Um, not a big surprise. So we see high pressure gradients upstream of that restriction on inflow. 
relatively um, uniform pressure behind the tongue, um, a little bit of pressure recovery compared to the pressure through that restriction. Um, and that's what we expect at these Reynolds numbers. Um, so we can think about that as Bernoulli effect, a little bit of pressure recovery. Um, if we reverse the flow direction, same kind of pattern. Now the jet forms coming from the velopharynx into the nasopharynx. And again, there's some degree of pressure recovery. Um, high pressures in this region. And uh, again, a turbulent jet forming. High pressure gradients in this region. So those are the main flow features. Um, Thinking quantitatively, so starting with, with the adult airway where we've got data, Reynolds number about 3,000 at the highest flow rate. We see that most of the uh, pressure gradient is in the nasal passage region. The curvature doesn't really affect the pressure and the slight uh, decrease in, in area doesn't affect the pressure until we get to the hypopharynx. So here around the epiglottis at the hypopharynx, there's a relatively large pressure drop and distributed over the nasal passages, uh, relatively large pressure drop. But these, in terms of resistances, they're relatively well balanced. Um, but most of this region, there's almost no pressure gradient whatsoever. Um, I think I'll skip that one. Velocity magnitudes, uh, the, the high magnitudes focused at the hypopharynx where there's a jet. And again, turbulent kinetic energy is high there. Um, we see some of the features that we expect to see for a curved flow. We've got vorticity here accompanying the bend in the airway from the nasal passages coming back to the vertical um, the pharynx back here, um, and recirculation, recirculation back in this region as well as behind the tongue. Um, but overall, we've got a somewhat complicated flow field, but, but uh, the main story in terms of pressures, which we're interested in, is, is told just by thinking about the cross-section. Okay, um, this is an example from our, our study with uh, younger children. Um, the Reynolds numbers are a little lower, but we still see the same sort of flow features. Um, but what's different is in these children, the, the resistance, um, the nasal resistance, is significantly higher than the resistance in the pharynx. And that was a pattern that we saw uh, uh, pretty much across the board for control subjects. So we see um, bigger pressure drop here, almost no resistance or pressure drop in this zone, relatively speaking, fourfold less. Um, and resistance is on the order of, of 0.2 kilopascals per liter per second. Um, in terms of patterns, I've got a series of, of pressure distributions that just show that. So we've got sort of a big change in pressure on inspiration, big change in pressure on expiration going out, relatively small changes as we're moving through the pharynx. Um, <coughs> this one's a little interesting. In some, some normal subjects and some subjects with obstructive sleep apnea, we see um, a relative difference in the pressure here and the pressure cycle here in the, in around the coenia or in the nasopharynx sometimes, um, where we have a relatively low pressure during expiration compared to most of what the pharynx sees, and um, much more uniform on the outflow. And that just has to do with where the narrowest point is. So here we've got a relatively narrow point. There's some degree of pressure recovery, but not a lot, and this is no low pressure. Um, OK, this is a larger study. Um, these are uh, older kids, and they're all obese. Uh, BMI's um, 30, you know, 35-ish. Um, these these are all subjects where we had rhinomanometry, and we were able to look at 30, uh, compare 30 subjects um, with uh, with apnea and 30 without. Um, very similar inspiration and expiration nasal resistances, and relatively high compared to what we see in the literature. So about 0.6 um, pascals per milliliter per second. Uh, and um, we were able to do CFD on uh, about half of these subjects that so we had good enough um, imaging data. And there uh, we saw uh, a number of things. The first thing is the, the minimal pressures that we see on average in the pharynx. That is this um, um, tend to be about uh, in, the, in the 250 Pascal range at peak inspirational flow. Um, and the resistances in the pharynx are lower than but somewhat more balanced with the nasal pressure, so on the order of 0.25 or so. Um, 
usually we have relatively large airway caliber in these subjects, the normal subjects. Um, and uh, <coughs> what else could I say about that? And then the last set of subjects, um, we started doing dynamic imaging to look at the compliance of the airway. So here we've got um, ten, uh, dynamic imaging of 10 different phases of flow. We compare the peak exp expiration phase to the peak inspiration phase. Um, the uh, nasal resistances are pretty similar to the last group that I talked about. Pharynx resistances were somewhat lower, um, but, but similar. Minimum pressures are now uh, more like one and a half uh, um, centimeters of water, or 150 pascal. Um, but we say the pressure in the pharynx is largely determined by the nasal resistance because it's, it's quite a bit higher than the resistance in the pharynx. Um, the other thing is we, I'll talk about compliance in my other talk later, um, but we define something called the effective compliance. How much is the airway cross-section changing and how much is the pressure cycling between inspiration and expiration. And for almost every control subject that we've looked at, every normal subject we've looked at, when we do awake MRI imaging, we see almost no change in shape in the pharynx and therefore very low compliances. So on the order of less than uh, 0.015, we've got here uh, millimeters squared per pascal. In a lot of cases, there it's, it's, it's less than 0.01 millimeters squared per pascal. So very, very stable. So um, by doing uh, dynamic MRI, uh, it's shown us that in normal children, at least, I don't think we need to do FSI because combination of, of the, the, the properties of the airway uh, passively and whatever activation is taking place is giving us a stable airway to work with. Um, so we're justified, at least for normals, in using rigid wall CFD. Um, and we've also looked at sedated normal children quite a bit younger, and that was a limited study that my collaborator did, but we saw the same thing with sedated normal children. Um, in our, the pharynx, we have area restrictions, expansions, curvature, and moderate Reynolds number where the physics justify using a turbulence model. We, we expect to see local turbulence because of the expansions and contractions that take place. Um, and that CFD modeling the pressure field with, with uh, the K Omega model has been verified uh, several different ways for us, and it's expensive enough that we can do larger series of patients. Um, in awake subjects, we see low airway motion and low mechanical compliance, and in general, nasal resistance uh, being bigger than the pharyngeal resistance. So to first order what most of you are doing, looking at the nasal passages, is pretty important to determining what the pharynx has to deal with in terms of loads through the respiratory cycle. So to some degree, the CFD of the pharynx might not be so important, even though we are expecting that we'll continue to do this. Um, but we think it's a useful enough tool for uh, calculating pressure gradients, and we'll show some of the correlations between pressure gradients locally and airflow velocities. So um, we've published several papers on this, and our work is supported by the NIH and a little bit by the NSF, and these are my clinical collaborators. Thank you.